All right. I'm super excited to have Crane join us today. We reached out to him specifically because of his expertise in business email compromise. What is it and what should we teach? BEC is the silent killer of the internet. We're all hearing about ransom because it's always in the news. Because if you get hacked by ransom, where you're going to be in the news. But it's estimated organizations only lost about 500 million in ransomware last year. It may be 500 million, 700 million in ransomware this year. As Crane is about to show you, when it comes to BEC attacks and fraud, we don't deal in millions. We deal in billions. And this is purely 100% human-based attack. And primarily one of the only ways you can stop this is through the human. So I felt it was very important for you to better understand this risk so you can better manage this risk. Crane, you're on. All right. Thanks, Lance. Um, with that out of the way, um, so again, my name is Crane Hasselt. I'm the uh, Director of Threat Intelligence at Abnormal Security. Really excited to talk about um, uh, you know, what we've seen in the BEC threat landscape over the past couple of years. And really, as Lance mentioned, how BEC has really transformed into the primary threat that most businesses all around the world are, are focused on this year. Now, i um, got a lot of stuff to talk about here, but first I really wanna level set on the problem of business email compromise and not just look at the scope and how big it, it has become, but also understand why it's actually happened, why it has become such a big issue. Now, before we you know, get into th that problem, let's, let's throw down some definitions so we can all be on the same page about what we're actually talking about when we talk about BEC, because it's one of those terms that really has fallen into this very nebulous definition. And a lot of people mean a lot of different things when they're talking about BEC. You know, the definition that I primarily use when I'm talking about business email compromise is it's gonna be a targeted spear phishing attack that involves the impersonation of a trusted individual or someone that a target knows in order to trick that person into making a, a, into making a financial transaction or sending sensitive materials. Generally speaking, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about business email compromise. And there are two primary ways that this can actually happen. One is through spoofing either the display name, you know, look, looking at who it's coming from or the email address. Usually those are done in conjunction with one another, or it can be done through the actual compromise of an email account, which has become more uh, prominent more recently, which we'll talk about here in a bit, um, but using a compromised account to actually send the messages. One of the things that's really important to keep in mind, and I'll probably I'll mention this a couple of times as we go through this presentation, is when we're talking about business email compromise, we're generally talking about a simple response-based attack that doesn't include a phishing link, that does not include a malicious payload. It's simply a text-based attack that's trying to get a person to respond to it. Now, you know, Lance, Lance uh, you know, attributed to this a little earlier, but let's look at the, the numbers of the actual losses that are attributed to BEC. And all of these numbers are coming from, primarily from the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center, or, or IC3. And one of, the, one of the best alerts that, the, that IC3 put out was in late 2019. And in that, um, in that alert, IC3 said that between June of 2016 and October of 2019, more than $26 billion had been lost to, to the BEC attacks globally. And when you put that on a per month basis, that's about $708 million that's being lost every single month. And that was at this point about a year and a half, two years ago. And we know that BEC losses have only grown since then. The amount that's lost per BEC attack is about $96,000. And that does vary depending on the type of attack, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. And then what's also really fascinating is when you look at the most recent IC3 report that came out earlier this year, and you look at the comparisons of all of the different types of cybercrime that businesses are seeing on a, on a daily basis, BEC actually adds up to about 41% of all cybercrime losses that organizations are seeing. And when you compare that to other types of cybercrime activity, ransomware is a great example of that, it's not even close that BEC is the biggest financial, uh, biggest uh, cause of financial loss out there. 
So why has BEC become such a big problem? Well, my, my opinion, there are three primary reasons that BEC has become such a, the, the issue that it is today. The first is that traditional email defenses that have now been around for decades have primarily focused on technically sophisticated threats. They're fo they've been focused on things like ransomware or other types of malware or even credential phishing. And the cyber criminals have actually identified this and they've noticed this. And what they've done is they've pivoted their tactics and moved to less technically sophisticated techniques, moving to more pure social engineering instead of using malicious payloads or malicious links. And so they're, they sort of, they've sort of adapted to the improved defenses that as a community we have, we, we've gotten to. The second reason is if you think of cybercrime from a, the, the perspective of a, of a business, um, and in most cybercrime is a business because it's financially motivated. From a, from, for BEC, it has a much higher return on investment than other types of cyber attacks. You know, one of the things that, you know, I've been saying for a number of years was, you know, at some point, the Eastern European and the Russian cyber criminals that have, you know, historically been known for more technically sophisticated cyber attacks are going to start thinking to themselves, you know, why am I spending all of this time and resources and money you know, setting up infrastructure for my malware or hiring developers for my malware, when I can just send someone an email, ask them to send me money, and they'll do it. The overhead there is so much lower and the amount of profit that they can make from a BEC attack is so much higher that I think we're, we've, we started seeing more sophisticated actors moving into the BEC space in recent years. And I think that's going to continue, that's going to continue moving, uh, in increasing moving forward. And then the final reason BEC has become such a problem is at the end of the day, social engineering is extremely effective. As long as human beings have been on this planet and we've been interacting with one another, we've been social engineering each other. The only difference is today, we're doing it through email, through a computer, instead of doing it face-to-face -face or over the phone or through the mail. The same concepts that have been used literally for thousands of years to con each other are still being used today in BEC attacks and other types of scams. And so that's you know, a very brief overview of you know, why, you know, how big of a problem BEC has become over the past five to six years and why it's become such a big problem. So next I wanna sort of pivot into looking at the, the, the various flavors of BEC, you know, what types of BEC attacks that we're seeing on a, on a regular basis. Now, the first one is uh, it, our, our wire transfer attacks. Now these wire transfer attacks, this is really where BEC you know, uh, 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 started with back in about 2014, 2015, basic CEO impersonation scam. Someone trying to, you know, impersonating the executive at a company and is saying, you know, can you please send a, a, a wire transfer to this vendor that, that you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a payment that's overdue. This is where BEC has come from. Still about 20% or so of all of the BEC attacks we see on a regular basis are requesting wire transfers to a fictitious vendor. Now, the upsides to these from the cyber criminals perspective is the payouts are generally significantly higher. You know, the average amount for these wire transfer requests is between usually between fifty and sixty thousand dollars, as you'll see here on a couple of slides. That could, depending on that type of wire transfer request, that could be significantly higher. But on average, it's about fifty to sixty thousand dollars. And then also, what we'll see, and we'll see this uh, more on the next slide, is when we talk about these types of requests, the threat actors can actually develop some pretty sophisticated pretexts and reasons why um, these payments need to be made. Now, on the downside of this, if you look at this from the cyber criminals perspective, you know, the payouts, while they may be higher, they're actually, they take a lot more time to actually go through. In order to get the money from point A, which is the target organization, to point B, which is the scammer, it needs to go through multiple different channels. It needs to get wired to a bank account. From that bank, from that mule account, it actually needs to go to through, usually through a number of different hops that where you're also going to be losing money along the way before it eventually gets back to the scammer. And it also requires those money mules. It, it, it requires a, generally a third person that is going to be receiving and passing on the money uh, that other types of BEZ attacks don't require. And you'll see here in just a second what those types of attacks are. Now, this is one of the more sophisticated pretexts that we've, uh, that we've seen more recently. And what we've seen is some of these sophisticated actors that are in places like 
Eastern Europe or Russia or even Israel, where Israel is one of the places where we're seeing a really emerging hotspot for BEC actors, um, we see these more sophisticated pretexts. In this case, it's, a, it's an actor that is first impersonating the CEO of a company and saying that there is a really important uh, confidential payment that needs to be done. And what, they, what this actor does is they use one persona and then pass the target employee off to a secondary persona that's actually uh, impersonating a legitimate uh, attorney in places like Western Europe. And that, that second persona is the one that's actually going to be um, working on the, the actual payments. And so this is an example of some of these sophisticated pretexts that we've started seeing over the past couple of years that, the, the, that BEC actors are able to do with wire transfer requests. Another type of BEC attack that's really undergone some really significant transformations over the past year and a half to two years is payroll diversion. And in these attacks, it's essentially a BEC actor that's going to be impersonating an employee at a company, usually going to be a C-level executive, who's, uh, who's going to be contacting someone on the human resources team to say, you know, I've just changed my, uh, my bank account. I need to update my direct deposit information. Can I just give you the information? Can I give you the, the account details and see if you can make the, account, the change on my end? And so that's sort of the concept behind these attacks. Over the past year and a half, this has gone through a significant decline to the point of in July of last year, only about 3% of all of the BEC attacks that we were seeing on a, on a monthly basis and during that month were actually requesting payroll, payroll uh, diversions. Whereas now, since the middle of last year, we've seen an almost consistent month over month increase um, as actors have actually moved to the types of accounts that are being used to receive these funds. And a month over month, now about 25% of all of the BEC attacks we see on a monthly basis are now requesting uh, payroll changes. And you know, one of the some of the upsides to these are the detection of for these attacks is actually usually delayed. If you think about it, you're usually getting paid once every two weeks. And so that is, if I'm not receiving my my paycheck right away, I might not realize that. And so there may be a little bit of a lag time between the time that the, the, the money is actually sent into a mule account and the time it's actually identified by the employee who's, who's missing the money. And that delayed detection uh, increases the success rate that the money will be able to get passed on to the scammer without being retrieved by, by a financial institution. And then the other upside to it is a lot of the, the payroll diversion activity that we see today is driven by prepaid cards. These are cards that you can pick up at many big box stores like a Walmart. And these are cards that are, ex that are generally going to be marketed to receiving direct deposits or other types of, of, of uh, government benefits. And these cards, because they're easier to set up, um, and in, in some cases they can be set up online only without actually having to purchase the actual card, um, it, becomes, it, becomes, it gets a little bit more attractive um, for scammers. Now the downsides to these, obviously in most cases, there's an unknown amount. They don't know how much the employees are actually making. So they don't know how much they're actually supposed to be getting in. Generally speaking though, as I mentioned, they're going to be targeting executives. So the thought process there is that there's going to be a, a larger dollar amount than, than, uh, than trying to impersonate some other employee at a company. And the targets are, are very limited. Obviously the, P, the number of employees at a company that I can actually change and have control over someone's uh, direct deposit account is very limited. And so those are really the only employees that would be the, the targets for these types of attacks. So the third type of BEC attack, which is, you know, has become, has, has increased significantly over the past couple of years, are BEC attacks that are requesting gift cards as a form of payment. And you can see an example of one of these on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, generally, these are going to be attacks that are going to be impersonating either the CEO or executive at a company or even an employee's supervisor saying that, you know, I'm looking to get, uh, some, to get some gift cards for either rewards for employees or gifts for potential customers. Can you go out and buy a thousand to $1,500 of these, of, gift, of certain types of gift cards and, and, you know, take pictures of them and send them to me, right? And what's really interesting here, the reason these have become so popular is one, 
they're usually not reversible. Once they've been sent to the scammer, they are laundered extremely fast. You know, with we've seen, you know, I've done some research where looking at the time when these even like $2,000 of, you know, $100 Apple iTunes gift cards are sent to a scammer and those are individually laundered, uh, they're generally going to be posted for sale on online peer-to-peer cryptocurrency exchanges. And they go from the time they're received, the first ones received by the scammer to the time that, that those cards are laundered and hit the scammer's bank account can be as little as about two hours. And so that is a very, very fast process. Um, it also doesn't, doesn't require a middleman um, or a money mule in order to facilitate these transactions. The, the pictures of the gift cards are sent directly to the scammers. The scammers post them up on, on someplace like Paxful, and then they're immediately laundered from there. But really, I think one of the real reasons that gift card uh, attacks have become so popular is the population of potential employees that can be targeted by these attacks is significantly higher. You know, essentially any, any employee at a company can be the target of one of these attacks. You know, I've seen gift card BEC campaigns targeting a single organization where 50 or 60 employees were targeted at any given time. And this isn't a, you know, the success rate needs to be really high for these attacks. If I'm just making, if I, my success rate is maybe 1%, I'm having a good payday at the end of the day. And so I think that's one of the really big reasons that, uh, that, that these types of attacks have become so popular. The downsides to these are the payouts are much, much smaller. The average request we see for gift card BEC attacks is about uh, $1,000 to $1,500. And the ploys are much less convincing. You know, I sort of went, ran through what one of these things might look like. And while the initial premise of one of these attacks that, you know, I need rewards for, for employees or gifts for customers may make a little bit more sense. As you go along with this and you try to get the employee to go purchase these individual cards, take pictures of them, uh, each one of them individually, send them all separately, scratch off the backs of them. You know, they have to, they have to be emailed and not sent in person. It, it sort of allows a lot of time for red flags to sort of pop up here. But I think obviously because we've continued to see such a big rise of these types of attacks, about 50% of all of the BEC attacks we see on a monthly basis are requesting gift cards. And it's been steady over the past couple of years because they're so popular that, that must mean that the return on investment, the ROI for these attacks must still be there or else the actors wouldn't continue to do them. But really the biggest BEC threat today that I think is really important for everyone to understand, and as we go through with this, this is really where security awareness really comes in, is what we call vendor email compromise. And vendor email compromise is essentially a hybrid between credential phishing attacks and identity deception attacks, where a threat actor may use a, phishing, uh, a, a credential phishing campaign to compromise mailboxes of a number of different employees. The actor will then go into those mailboxes and identify high value targets that are, um, that are involved in things like payments or invoices or customer contact. And once those high value targets have been identified, they will then sit on those mailboxes and collect intelligence to better understand you know, when payments are due, who the customers are, what normal communication patterns look like, They'll steal copies of invoices and they'll sit on these mailboxes for weeks, if not months, until they eventually inject themselves into a legitimate payment that's actually supposed to be due. And they know what's actually due because they're getting all of the information from these mailboxes. And then they target one of those vendor or suppliers customers with an email that looks extremely realistic because they're using all this information they've collected. And so the ultimate target here is going to be that vendor or suppliers customers that are going to be the ones sending out the payment. And vendor email compromise is really interesting because I think when you, when you talk to most people about phishing attacks today, most people will probably give you the answer of you know, who would actually fall for these types of attacks. And what's interesting about vendor email compromise, when you look at these emails, the, the question goes from you know, who would actually fall for this to who wouldn't fall for this because everything looks really, 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 really realistic when you're looking at these types of attacks. You know, one category of, of BEC attacks that we've seen become more frequent over the, really over the past six months or so are uh, BEC attacks that are requesting aging reports. 
And this is what I consider to be you know, a vendor email compromise attack, really without the initial compromise. And so for those of you who don't know what an aging report is, an aging report is a report that's handled by vendors and suppliers that contains all of the outstanding payments that are due by customers and also includes all of the additional contact information for those customers, for whoever we get in, for whoever the accounts payable person is at those customers. And what we've seen more recently is instead of compromising accounts, we've seen actors impersonating uh, you know, a, a, some executive at a company um, contacting an accounts receivable specialist and saying, hey, can you send me the most up-to-date aging report um, for, for, my, for, my, for my understanding, for my knowledge, so I can do some research. And the employee may send that, that report, which looks very similar to what you see on the screen here. And the, the actors will then use that information to craft an email that's going to be targeting uh, that vendor or supplier's customers, very much in the exact same way that we see with classical vendor email compromise attacks, except there, isn't, there is no actual mailbox compromise on the front end. And so why are vendor email compromise uh, attacks such a threat? So one is the amount that's lost in these types of attacks is usually significantly higher to other types of BEC attacks. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, on average, wire you know, general uh, CEO impersonation, executive impersonation, wire transfer BEC attacks, the average requests there are between fifty and sixty thousand dollars usually. Um, there was a, some great research that was done by the Better Business Bureau about a year ago that shows that for vendor email compromise attacks, the amount that's requested or lost in those attacks is about one hundred and ten thousand dollars. So we're talking about generally twice twice the amount of money that's being lost from vendor email compromise attacks to other types of wire transfer VEC attacks. Also, the actors are using trusted identities, individuals that the employee is actually communicating with on a regular basis because they're part of these financial transactions. And so because that trust has been built up and the employee recognizes those normal communication patterns that the actor actually knows, they're able to sort of leverage that trust to their advantage. Again, as I mentioned there, these emails are crafted using real intelligence that are collected from these mailboxes, which results in extremely realistic looking uh, emails that are being sent to the vendor and suppliers uh, customers. And then the final reason that they're such a threat is, you know, as I mentioned, the ultimate organizations that are sending the money are the customers. That being said, the ones that are actually compromised are the vendors. And so the, 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 the customers that don't actually have have actually no, uh, no control over the initial compromise. So it, it, that, that compromise occurs outside their, uh, their area of control. And because that happens, they're not able to very well um, monitor for any potential ATO activity. Also, the, the, generally speaking, the vendors and suppliers that we see being compromised by vendor email compromise attacks are generally much smaller than other types of organizations that may not have the resources that can be dedicated to things like security awareness training or other types of email defenses. And so, you know, I've seen, I've seen uh, or, you know, companies as small as five people be the initial uh, uh, target of a, of, a, of a vendor email compromise attack on the credential phishing side of things. And that small vendors, customers were then targeted with follow-up phishing attacks. So there's a little bit of an overview. And we've, so far, we've looked at the problem of BEC. We've looked at the different types of BEC attacks that you might see on a day-to-day -day basis. But I'll close out here with looking at you know, security awareness training and how that can be used to better prepare our employees, our users, to defend against these types of attacks. So the first thing to keep in mind here, and I mentioned this very at the very beginning of my presentation, you know, phishing is not just about links and attachments. As we've seen with BEC attacks, most of these emails are only going to contain text. So if I'm training my users to look, only look out for bad links and bad attachments, it, is, it will not prepare them for these response-based attacks. And that sort of goes into you know, security awareness training as it has emerged as this, uh, as this industry, it was originally built around preventing malware attacks, preventing people from clicking on malicious payloads. It was not built around identifying you know, basic social engineering attacks. Also, it's really important to keep in mind that, that one size doesn't fit all. You know, from, a, from a BEC perspective, especially when we're talking about vendor email compromise attacks, 
because those actors, these cyber criminals are using intelligence based on real world interactions. If you're doing BEC security awareness training effectively, you should also be putting the time in there to, to in, include that intelligence that a, that, 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 an, uh, that a cyber criminal might be, might be using um, to, to socially engineer your, your users. And so it's much harder to automate these more real world BEC attacks than it is to automate something like a credential phishing uh, campaign or a, uh, or a malware campaign. It's much harder to automate those types of attacks. So you actually have to put in a little bit more work to make that type of training more effective and better for your users. And then finally, I think this is really important is, you know, when we think about what we're trying to accomplish with security awareness training, you know, this is, a, it has traditionally been a metric driven industry where I'm trying to get, you know, what is my click rate? What is my success rate for, for, a, for a, a phishing simulation? And what is, when you think about it, what's more important? Is that data more important or is the fact that I'm trying to prepare my users for more real world attacks, is that more important to think about when you are running these security awareness campaigns? And be, it's actually, it's, and I say that because it's very hard to measure the effectiveness and the success rate of response-based attacks because you know, with most phishing simulations, being able to click, on, click a link or open a payload is relatively easy to detect. But with BEC attacks, I have to actually look out for whether someone is responding to an email. And that requires inf additional infrastructure being set up. It requires additional monitoring that most security awareness uh, training platforms don't have the ability to do. And so, you know, while we want to be able to, to measure the, the, get some metrics behind our security awareness uh, uh, simulations, you know, that's not always possible. And, you know, when we're talking about, you know, is it better to, you know, leave the, that data behind and just make sure our users and employees are prepared? You know, that's, that's sort of a, a trade-off that you have to think about. And so that's all, that's all I have for today. Um, I'd be welcome to answer any questions, um, any, any contact information. You see some contact uh, information here on this slide. Feel free to reach out if anyone else has any, has any questions. All right. So lots of questions, Crane. That was fast and furious. <laughs> So folks, I'm just one or two quick points, and then we're going to ask Crane. BEC stands for Business Email Compromise, also commonly known as CEO fraud. As we've been saying throughout this uh, event, and Crane pointed out, people a lot of times have different definitions. And the other thing, oh, oh, Crane, I'm going to ask um, one question I've been seeing asked in Slack, and then I'm going to go to the Q&A in Zoom, is these seem, seem so basic. You know, gift cards, asking for a wire transfer. Why are people falling for these? What are the bad guys doing that makes this so effective and people happily transfer money, happily mm -hmm. buy gift cards? That's a great question. I think this goes back to something I mentioned a little bit earlier is, you know, at its core, social engineering is extremely effective. The same themes you see over and over and over again in BC attacks, as well as other types of phishing campaigns. You know, these actors have learned to harness the same principles that, uh, that, that, that you know, con artists have been able to use for, for a number of years. Fear, anxiety, doubt, reward. These are the themes that you see over and over and over again in these, uh, in these phishing attacks. And those are the, they, that's essentially, you know, it's very hard to override our ingrained human nature to trust what we see in front of us. And so that's that's primary. That's one of the primary reasons that um, uh, that these are being so successful. It's also you know when you look at the the weaknesses of email, just generally speaking, the the fact that I'm able to very easily change the display name to make it look like it's coming from a CEO or some other executive, you know, adds that level. You know, for most people who aren't technically sophisticated, I'm going to trust that that email is coming from my CEO without giving any other, without uh, having any other information to make me think that it's not. So I was reading those examples you shared, Crane, which are awesome. And what I noticed is one, almost no spelling errors, no mm -hmm. grammar errors. In this case, since they were English-based, the English was very good. But also, like you said, it seemed like the bad guys had done their research. Mm -hmm. They were pretending to be an executive. They pretended like they knew the individual. They pretended like they were part of the company. 
that seems like part of the, what makes this so successful. Absolutely. So we, we, we see that more and more, it's more and more common, you know, while we certainly see a heavy volume of the BEC attacks that have the traditional spelling grammatical errors. And most people would be like, no, what is, what is this? I would never fall for this type of thing. You know, you have some of the more sophisticated actors that are moving into the BEC space that really take their time crafting these messages, even outside of the vendor email compromise realm, you know, just in the basic, you know, CEO impersonation attacks, uh, you see a lot of these actors that are now requesting more, more and more, uh, uh, higher and higher amounts of money um, and taking the time to craft very sophisticated um, lures that are being sent to these uh, to, to employees to the point where there are some groups that we you know I, I really feel that there is you know in the un these underground you know underground forums that there is a um, they're, they're actually hiring people to translate certain uh, certain emails for them that are in perfect either native English or native French or native whatever language um, to make them more effective. And then where are these threat actors getting this information on people? So that's a great question. You know, what's really interesting when we when we un, when we look at you know how targets are identified through BEC attacks, what's really interesting is that the same legitimate commercial uh, services that sales and marketing teams all over the world use to identify sales prospects, these are the exact same services that BEC actors are are using to identify targets. And so they'll go in for either a um, or either a, a short-term trial or even use a compromised credit card to pay for one of these services. And they can do a number, they can search on a number of different variables and receive a very finely, nicely organized and curated list of potential targets me meeting those criteria that they then, then use to supplement with additional open source uh, information to identify things like who the CEO or executive I'm going to be impersonating is and use that as their base of, of targeting information to then send out the, the BEC campaigns. So Crane brings up a fantastic point. We think the bad guys are getting this information because they're hacking our data, they're finding an insider threat, they're going to the dark web and dealing in other cyber criminals. And Crane's like, no, if I wanna hack a company and if I wanna learn about executives, I'll just go to any sales database and buy the marketing data because the data rate is already out there. Yeah. Wow, exactly. That's, 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 that's exactly what they're doing. And I think what's, what's also really important to keep in mind is that there is a very robust underground communication network between these actors where they're always sharing tactics and techniques with each other to help each other out to, to make their attacks more successful. So, and this is, this is always going to be a cat and mouse game where we're going to be you know, evolving our defenses and making them better. And they're going to pivot in a, in a direction. And we all, that's why threat intelligence is so important because then we need to know where they're moving to, what the next iteration of these attacks uh, is gonna be in the future. All right, fantastic, Crane, really, really appreciate it. And folks, that's what makes BE so da dangerous. In many ways, it's a spear phishing attack, whaling attack, but no links, no attachments. The bad guys have done the research and people are falling for it to the tune of billions of dollars a year. Crane, thank you so much. Folks, if you have questions for Crane, please meet him in the Slack channel. Thank you, Crane. Thank you.